This video is sponsored by Brilliant. Stick around to the end of the video to learn more. Why do we look like our parents? Why do we have parents at all? What exactly is it that tells our body what to do and what to look like, and where do we get that from? To answer all these questions and so many more, we need to dive into one of the most important topics in all of biology, heredity. How traits are passed down from generation to generation. Without predictable patterns of inheritance, evolution would be impossible, and the survival and reproduction of any organism would be left to nothing but random chance. So let's get learning. Welcome back to Biologic. The longest running genetic experiment in history has been going on for over 20,000 years. The exact date for the domestication of dogs is a little bit hard to pin down, with some estimates stretching back as far as 40,000 years ago. But we know that by 15,000 years ago, we see the earliest known ceremonial burial for a canine companion, showing that wolves had officially become our friends. Since then, we've shaped these wild beasts into over 200 breeds and varieties, some bred for hunting, some for herding, some for crawling through holes, some for pulling sleds. Big and small, svelte and shaggy, fearsome and cuddly, all ready to take a nap at the foot of your bed. So how were we able to do this? Surely it couldn't have just been an accident that such vastly different characteristics should all just appear at random within the global canine population. The simple fact is that early humans weren't dumb. They noticed very early on that things tended to take on the traits of their parents. So as they domesticated the wolves around them, the ones that were the most loyal, the best hunters, the safest around children, were the ones that were the most likely to be bred and passed around. We don't know for sure how long that process took, but we can get an idea by looking at an experiment from the 1950s by Russian geneticist Dmitry Belyaev. Belyaev worked on a fox farm, raising foxes for fur, and wanted to test how quickly he could domesticate them the same way that we domesticated wolves so many millennia ago. He started by classifying the foxes into three categories, based on how they reacted when he attempted to feed and pet them. Class 3 would bite and run away. Class 2 would allow for some handling, but show no positive response. And Class 1 would positively approach him and show behavior such as whining or tail wag. Belyaev selectively bred only the tamest foxes in Class 1. And after just six generations of doing this, he found that he had to create a brand new class for these new exceedingly friendly foxes which whimpered for attention and were excited for human interaction and which would sniff and lick just like dogs. We call this process selective breeding, or in evolutionary terms, artificial selection deliberately breeding organisms with desired traits in order to produce a new population that expresses or enhances those traits. This is literally the exact same thing that natural selection does, except instead of the environment selecting for individuals that best suit their niche, it's humans selecting for individuals that express the traits that we like. And this doesn't just work in animals. In fact, if you go to a grocery store today, every bit of produce that you can buy has been modified through artificial selection. Plants like wild mustard, which has been selectively bred for tastier leaves, stems, flowers, and more, producing cabbage, brussels sprouts, kohlrabi, kale, broccoli, and cauliflower. Just like chihuahuas and wolfhounds, these are all the same species, showing incredible diversity because of artificial selection. And talking about plants brings us to why we know this stuff. It all goes back to an Augustinian monk working in the garden of his abbey in what is now the Czech Republic, all the way back in the 1860s. Gregor Mendel loved science. He studied physics, chemistry, and mathematics at the University of Vienna, and he developed rigorous research methods to learn about the pea plants in his abbey. He began by separating the plants into seven true breeding populations, meaning that when self-pollinated, they would only produce offspring with the exact same characteristics as themselves. Mendel didn't know it, but what he called true breeding plants were simply homozygotic. We'll talk about what that word means in a minute. Once he had true breeding populations, plants with only purple or white flowers, axial or terminal flower positions, yellow or green seeds, round or wrinkled seeds, puffy or tight seed pods, green or yellow seed pods, and tall or short stems, he was ready to start hybridizing the populations by pollinating one with the other, fertilizing a white flower with a purple flower, for example, and seeing what the offspring looked like. What he found was revolutionary. All the flowers in the first or F1 generation of offspring were purple, but then, when he self-pollinated them with each other, 
one quarter of the flowers in the F2 generation were white. Somehow, the ability to produce white flowers was hiding within the purple flowering plants. But how could that be possible? Almost 200 years later, here's how we know it works. DNA is broken up into specialized coding segments called genes. Each of those traits that Mendel was testing, from color to pod shape to plant height, are each coded for by their own individual genes. But genes don't come in just one style. Think about the coloration of the flowers, for example. The gene that codes for the pigment that gives the flowers their color comes in different varieties, or as we call them, alleles. There's an allele for purple flowers and an allele for white flowers, but ultimately these are just different versions of the same pigment gene. This means that the phenotype of the plant, or what characteristics actually get expressed, is dependent on its genotype, or what alleles it possesses. But this is where it gets really interesting. Each plant has two parents, each of which gave it some DNA. That means that each plant doesn't have just one allele for what color flowers it will present, it has two alleles, and they could be different. In the pure breeding populations, the plants had two identical copies of the color allele, so any given plant could only ever give or receive this same one allele. That's why they always produce the same color. We call the condition of having two identical copies of the same allele being homozygotic, coming from the Greek word homos, meaning the same. When the purple flowers were hybridized with the white flowers, the resulting offspring in the F1 generation were no longer homozygotes, because they inherited one purple allele and one white allele from their parents. This made them heterozygotic, from the Greek word hetero, meaning different. However, the heterozygotic plants still produce purple flowers. This means that the allele which codes for purple pigment is dominant. Dominant alleles, like the one for purple flowers, are expressed even if there's only one copy of them in your genome. Whereas recessive alleles, like the one for white flowers, are only expressed if they account for both copies of the gene. So now to incorporate all those words we just learned, in order to express a recessive phenotype, you must be homozygotic for the recessive allele. If you are homozygotic dominant or heterozygotic, then the dominant phenotype will be expressed. So then what happened with the F2 generation? If the F1 generation were all heterozygous and all produced purple flowers, then how is it that 25% of their offspring were homozygous recessive with white flowers? In order to understand this, all you need to know is everything that we just talked about with alleles and a little bit about probability. Let's draw a square and split it into four boxes. Now we have a simple table with two columns and two rows. Now let's think for a moment about what could possibly happen when two plants reproduce. Each plant has two alleles, but can only pass on one of them to their offspring. That way their offspring will end up with two alleles for themselves. We know that both of the parent plants are heterozygotes, meaning that they have one dominant allele and one recessive allele, but we don't know for sure which one they're going to pass on. So let's put one of each possible allele from one parent in the columns, and one of each possible allele from the other parent in the rows. Now all we have to do is distribute these possibilities down into the boxes to see what sort of offspring these parents can produce. If this dominant allele pairs with this dominant allele, then the offspring will be homozygous dominant, so it will have purple flowers. If this dominant allele pairs with this recessive allele, then the offspring will be heterozygous and still have purple flowers. We can see that happening in this square too. Remember, it doesn't matter what position the dominant or recessive alleles are in, it only matters that they're present. And finally, if this recessive allele pairs with this recessive allele, then the offspring will be homozygous recessive and will have white flowers. So altogether, using what we know about alleles and some simple logic, we can predict that if these two plants reproduce, there's a 75% chance that their offspring will be purple and a 25% chance that they'll be white. And that's exactly what Mendel saw in the F2 generation of his pea plants. Understanding this concept is incredibly important for the rest of your biology education. So let's go through a couple more scenarios to make extra sure that you've got it. What if one parent were homozygous dominant and the other were heterozygous? In this case, we would see the whole top row ending up being homozygous dominant, getting one dominant allele from both parents, and the whole bottom row would be heterozygous, getting one dominant and one recessive allele. So in the end, there's a 50-50 chance that the offspring will be homozygous or heterozygous, but there's a 100% chance that the flowers will be purple. Now try this one on your own. What if one parent was heterozygous and the other was homozygous recessive? Pause the video here and try to figure out what their offspring might look like. I'll give you the answer in three, two, one. 
when we plot out the probability here, we see a similar situation to the last cross, with 50% being homozygous and 15% being heterozygous. But this time, the homozygotes are recessive. That means the offspring also have a 50% chance of having purple flowers and a 50% chance of having white flowers. These simple four-squared tables are called Punnett squares, named after Reginald Punnett, who developed them as an easy way to visualize genetic possibilities back in 1905. But with only four squares, we're only able to really test two allelic possibilities from one gene. But what if we wanted to test a little bit more, like, say, two genes? Let's look at two more characteristics from Mendel's pea plants, whether the seeds are yellow or green and round or wrinkly. The alleles that made the seeds yellow and round are both dominant, whereas the alleles that made the seeds green and wrinkly are both recessive. So what if we took a plant that was homozygous for yellow and round alleles and hybridized it with a plant that was homozygous for green and wrinkly alleles? As predicted, the offspring would be heterozygous for both alleles, so it would still be round and yellow. But that's just the F1 generation. In order to understand the F2 generation, we need to make a bigger table, with not four squares, but four times four squares, meaning 16 squares. This is gonna look a little intense at first, but don't freak out, you can do this, you just have to try. Instead of giving each row in each column a single possible allele, we'll give them two, with a single possible allele from each trait that we're observing. Remember, we're testing for two traits instead of just one, and we still don't know which allele will go where, so we have to write in every possible combination to see what could possibly come out. The first column will be both dominant alleles. The second column will be one dominant and one recessive, and the third will be the other way around. And finally, the fourth column will be both recessive alleles. And since the other parent has this same genotype, we can copy these columns into the rows as well. We now have what's known as a dihybrid cross. And to solve it, all we have to do is the exact same thing that we did last time. Fill in each box with the alleles from each parent to figure out what their offspring could possibly look like. So, for example, this first box would get two dominant Y alleles and two dominant R alleles, giving it this genotype and this phenotype. Now, take a second to pause the video here and try to fill in the rest for yourself. Again, it's not as crazy as it looks, just give it a try. I'll give you the answer in three, two, one. Here is the completed dihybrid cross, and if we look closely at it, we can start to see the logic. For example, take a look at the first column and row. All of them are going to get at least one dominant Y allele and at least one dominant R allele, so we already know the phenotype for all of them is going to be yellow and round. Looking at the bottom right quadrant, this is the only place where being homozygous for the recessive green allele is possible, so that's the only place that we see that phenotype. Just as we see homozygous dominant for both alleles in the top left, we see homozygous recessive for both alleles in the bottom right. And notice this diagonal line of perfect heterozygotes going from bottom left to top right. Patterns like this are one of the many things that make science so mathematically beautiful. Most importantly, notice how the phenotypic ratio is different than what we saw before. In the simple monohybrid cross, we saw three dominant phenotypes and one recessive phenotype, a three to one ratio. But when we factor in the possibilities for two traits at the same time, we see a ratio of nine, three, three, one. Nine offspring with both dominant traits, three expressing one dominant trait, three expressing the other dominant trait, and one expressing both recessive traits. That was Mendel's second big discovery, and you just learned it from scratch. Through his experiments, Mendel developed three laws of inheritance, which we'll adapt a little bit to include some modern terminology just to make sure that everything is extra clear. First, the law of dominance states that only the dominant allele will be expressed, even if a recessive allele is present. Second, the law of segregation states that only one allele from each trait will be passed on from each parent. And third, the law of independent assortment states that each individual trait will follow the first two laws independently of each other. So, for example, the color of the flowers will not determine the height of the plants or the color of the seeds. These three laws of inheritance are still the foundation of genetics to this very day. But because this is biology and not physics, you shouldn't be surprised to learn that there are massive exceptions to each of those three laws. For example, instead of just one dominant allele being expressed, you could have incomplete dominance, where dominant and recessive traits are blended together to form a new third trait, or co-dominance, where two dominant traits appear simultaneously within the same individual. 
There's also gene linkage, in which genes which are located close together on a chromosome tend to be moved around and passed on together as well. Then there are polygenic traits, where one single trait is controlled by several different genes, and pleiotropic genes, where one single gene controls several different traits. The point is, it's not always so easy to break things down into simple terms the way that Mendel did. Understanding how these patterns of inheritance work can help you learn a lot more than just why you look like your parents or your grandparents. They can also help illuminate some mysteries about biomedical science as well. For example, think about a genetic disease that's controlled by a dominant allele, like Huntington's disease, for example. Because it's controlled by a dominant allele, you only need that one allele to express the disease. So if you have a parent with the disease, you have at least a 50% chance of inheriting it yourself. Whereas if you have a genetic disorder that's controlled by a recessive allele, like sickle cell anemia for example, you might see the disease skip over generations waiting for someone to be homozygous recessive. Whereas the heterozygotes are what we call carriers, meaning that they don't express the disease, but they carry the recessive allele and can pass it on to their offspring. There are also what is known as sex-linked traits, meaning that they're controlled by alleles on the sex chromosomes. For example, certain types of color blindness are controlled by a recessive allele on the X chromosome. And that means that chromosomal males are much more likely to express that recessive allele because they only have the one X chromosome to work with. Without another chromosome with a dominant allele to balance things out, that one recessive allele will be expressed because it's the only one there. But those are all topics for another time. The important thing to remember right now is that the patterns of inheritance that we talked about in this video are just the start of the story. I've simplified things for the sake of understanding, but nature is not simple, and you should never be surprised when it surprises you. We've got a lot more stuff to cover in this series, so I hope you stay tuned. But until then, I'm Forrest Falki. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Have an awesome rest of your day. Never stop learning. Bye-bye. And now, a word from our sponsor. Brilliant is an amazingly fun educational app that allows you to explore math, science, data analysis, programming, and so much more with thousands of hands-on lessons designed by an award-winning team of educators, researchers, and professionals at places like MIT, Duke, and Caltech, putting your education right in the palm of your hand. And the best part is, they're offering my subscribers everything they have to offer absolutely free for a full 30 days, plus 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. And all you gotta do to get it is go to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai, click the link down in the description, or scan the QR code on the screen. Brilliant's fun and interactive lessons teach you incredible new concepts and develop your problem-solving skills, all while fostering a powerful daily learning habit that can last a lifetime. As always, I recommend you start out with their scientific thinking course. It helps you see the hidden mechanisms behind your everyday life and appreciate the scientific beauty of the world around you. So head on over to brilliant.org slash forestvalkai, scan the QR code on the screen, or use the link in the description to get started right now. Remember, you get to try everything they have to offer for free for a full 30 days, and you get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video. Thanks so much to you for watching it, and I'll see you next time.